Francaise de Chicago, and today I will be reading Part 2, Chapter 6 from Bonjour Tristesse by Francois Segon. The next morning, I took my father on a walk with me along the road. We talked cheerfully of trivial things. As we headed back towards the villa, I suggested to him that we might go through the pine wood. It was exactly half past ten. I was on time. My father walked ahead of me. The path was narrow and covered in brambles, which he pushed aside for me as we went, so that I wouldn't scratch my legs. When I saw him come to a sudden halt, I knew he had seen them. I went up to him. Cyril and Elsa were asleep, lying stretched out on the pine needles, giving every appearance of bucolic bliss. It was just what I had told them to do, but when I saw them like that, I felt heartbroken. Elsa's love for my father and Cyril's love for me could not stop them from being each as beautiful and young as the other, or now so close together. I glanced over at my father. He stood motionless, gazing at them as if mesmerized and looking abnormally pale. I took him by the arm. Don't let's waken them, let's go. He cast a glance at Elsa lying back in all her youthful beauty, all golden-skinned and red-haired, and with a slight smile playing on her lips, the smile of the young nymph who has at last been overtaken. Turning on his heel, he began to stride away. The trollop, he was muttering, the trollop. Why do you say that? Isn't she free to do as she pleases? That's not the point. Do you like it, seeing Cyril in her arms? I don't love him anymore, I said. And I don't love Elsa either, he cried out furiously. But it does something to me, even so. After all, I've, er, lived with her. That makes it much worse. I knew that made it worse. He must have felt the same urge as I had to rush forward, to part them, to reclaim what was or had once been his. If Anne could hear you now. What? If Anne could hear me? Obviously she wouldn't understand or she'd be shocked. That's only natural. But what about you? You're my daughter, aren't you? Don't you understand me anymore? Are you shocked too? How easy it was for me to steer his thoughts. I was rather alarmed at knowing him so well. I'm not shocked, I said, but you've got to face up to things. Elsa has a short memory. She likes Cyril. She's lost to you, especially after what you did to her. People don't forgive things like that. If I wanted to, my father began and then stopped as if afraid to go on. You wouldn't succeed, I said emphatically, as if it were quite natural to be discussing his chance of getting Elsa back. But I'm not thinking of it, he said, coming to his senses. Of course not, I said with a shrug of the sh shoulders. The shrug meant, impossible, dear chap, you're out of the running. He said nothing further to me on the way back to the house. When he got there, he took Anne in his arms and held her close for a few moments with his eyes closed. Smiling and surprised, she made no objection. I left the room and went to lean against the wall in the hallway, trembling with shame. At two o'clock, I heard Cyril's faint whistle and went down to the beach. He made me get into the boat straight away and head out to sea. There were no other boats. No one was thinking of going out in that sun. Once we were on the open sea, he lowered the sail and turned to face me. We had hardly said a word. About this morning, he began. Be quiet, I said. Oh, do be quiet. He gently pushed me down to the tarpaulin. We were soaked, running with sweat. We were clumsy and in a hurry. The boat swayed rhythmically beneath us. I lay looking at the sun just above me, and suddenly I heard Cyril's whispering, masterful yet tender. The sun was becoming detached from the sky. It was bursting open and falling on me. Where was I? It was as if I were at the bottom of the ocean. I was lost in time. I was in extremes of pleasure. I cried out to Cyril, but he made no reply. There was no need. Then came the coolness of the salt air. We were laughing together, dazzled, languid, grateful. We had sun and sea, laughter and love. Would we ever experience them again as we did that summer, with all the vividness and intensity lent to them by fear and remorse? As well as the very real physical pleasure that I got from love, I also experienced a kind of intellectual pleasure from thinking about it. The expression to make love has an attraction all of its own, which, if you analyze it, springs from the meaning of the individual words. I was charmed by the fact that the verb to make, with its clear-cut material connotations, was associated with the poetic extraction, abstraction of the word love. I had used the phrase before quite unblushingly, without the least embarrassment, and without noticing how it could be savored. Now I felt that I was becoming easily embarrassed. I would lower my gaze whenever my father looked at all intently at Anne, 
whenever she laughed that new little husky and unseemingly laugh of hers, which made both my father and me turn pale and stare out the window. If we had told Anne that her laugh was like that, she would not have believed us. She did not behave as if she were my father's mistress, but rather as if she were a dear friend. Yet at night, no doubt, I refused to entertain such thoughts. I hated notions that unsettled me. The days passed. I rather forgot about Anne and about my father and Elsa. Love made me live with my eyes wide open, yet with my head in the clouds. I was pleasant and peaceable. Cyril asked me whether I was not afraid of conceiving a child. I told him that I was relying on him, and he seemed to find that quite natural. Perhaps that was why I had given myself to him so readily, because he would not leave it to me to take responsibility, and hence, if I had a child, he would be to blame. He took upon himself what I could not bear to take on, responsibilities. In any case, I found it difficult to imagine myself pregnant, given my slim, firm body. For once, I congratulated myself on having an adolescence frame. But Elsa was growing impatient. She constantly plied me with questions. I was always afraid of being discovered in her company or in Cyril's. She arranged things so that whenever my fa wherever my father was, she was. She ran into him everywhere. Then she would congratulate herself on imagined triumphs and on glimpsing what she said were repressed impulses of his that he couldn't conceal. This was a girl who, frankly, because of what she was, was well used to the idea of love as a commercial exchange. So I was astonished to see her becoming so romantic and get so excited by details such as a look or a gesture, she being someone who had been molded to suit precise requirements of men in a hurry. The fact is that she was not used to having a role that involved any form of subtlety, and the role that she was now playing must have seemed to her the height of psychological refinement. Even if my father was gradually becoming obsessed with Elsa, Anne didn't seem to notice. He was more tender and attentive towards her than ever, and that frightened me because I put his attitude down to unconscious remorse. The important thing was that nothing should happen over the remaining three weeks. We would return to Paris, Elsa would go on her way, and, assuming they were still decided on it, my father and Anne would get married. In Paris, there would be Cyril, and, just as she had been able to stop me from loving him here, Anne would not be able to stop me from seeing him. He had a room there well away from where his mother lived. I could already imagine the window opening onto the amazing pink and blue Parisian skies, pigeons cooing on the rail outside, and Cyril and me on the narrow bed. That's all for now. Thank you.